Hey everyone, in this video we are going to go over a, just a brief overview of some non-traditional database management system products. Now the relational model came from computer limitations. It was really hard to store a whole bunch of data all at once in main memory and it was even hard to store an entire databases worth of data in one massive file. Oftentimes uh, these files had to be broken up into multiple tables so that it was actually possible to work with them. And the relational model came from this world of limitations right here where a lot of databases had to be broken up into these smaller tables with the relationships between tables so that you could connect the smaller tables and see the entire picture of the data. Nowadays, however, uh, increased power does allow for larger tables, which can be stored in memory all at once. It's also the case that new types of data might need to be stored differently. If you're using a database that holds things like photos or videos or something like that, they might not fit very well inside of a relational database with tables and all that kind of stuff. You might need to kind of work outside the box. So a traditional database management system, one that is designed to work with a relational database, might not be the best choice for every single database that's out there. Now, something I briefly want to talk about is an ACID transaction. So a transaction really is just an action that makes a change to a database. The transaction has to do with a um, person requesting that a database management system makes that change to the database and the change is attempted to be made and then it's checked to make sure that the entirety of the change is made. And if the entirety of the change is made, then that change is allowed to be actually saved to the database. And if the change is not completely made, let's say you're trying to change multiple rows of data and only two out of five of them actually are successfully changed, then the, uh, the whole transaction is canceled. Everything is rolled back. All the changes are reverted and the database just remains as normal. This is what an ACID transaction really is. So it's an atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable transaction. Atomic meaning that there aren't like multiple parts to this change. The change happens either all at once or not at all. You can't split that change down at all. Consistent means that it, well, remains consistent with the database. It's isolated because it's not related to any other changes that are being made, any other transactions that are being done, and durable because if something were to break part of the way through, the entire transaction is reversed and nothing is changed. So an ACID transaction guarantees that an, a that an action on a database is performed completely. If it can't be completely performed, it is not performed at all. And a lot of database management systems, uh, at least the more traditional ones working with relational databases, were working exclusively in ACID transactions in order to make sure all of the changes that were being made were actually, you know, completely being made. And this was really, really important earlier on in database technology because uh, things used to be a lot more error prone back in the day, especially if you think about connections, uh, connections between computers and a network used to drop out a lot more, which opened up a lot more of a risk for a transaction to be broken or something like that. Like the errors were more likely to happen and because actions took longer to process than they would now, given that computing technology was slower, you really want to make sure that these changes really, really are committed because otherwise if something gets messed up, it could affect hours and hours and hours of work. So nowadays, ACID transactions are definitely still used. They're still used for commercial applications. So for example, if you're buying something from an online store, like from Amazon or something, they use ACID transactions in order to really make sure that you have properly 
bought the item that the uh, the uh, shop has properly sold the item, you know, that things are actually uh, shipped when they're meant to be shipped, all that kind of stuff. Acid transactions are still used for really important changes to databases that cannot be wrong, but they're less necessary for other purposes nowadays. For example, if you are collecting a database of tweets from a whole bunch of accounts and you miss you know, one tweet of one million, you only save half of the tweet, for example, out of one million tweets. That's not necessarily a big deal. It's totally fine for you to occasionally miss out on a little bit of data every once in a while. So an acid transaction may not be as necessary for that. This is really going to um, come, this is really going to hold true for big data where they're taking petabytes of data at once and you know trying to store as much data as possible on a user and if one really tiny addition to a user's profile and or sorry not on a user but like a person like a, a person's profile if one tiny detail on a person's profile is a little bit you know missing or you know half a tweet gets saved or you know there's like one piece of information about them missing every once in a while for one user out of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of users and out of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points it doesn't really matter so much so acid transactions aren't the most necessary the other thing about acid transactions is that they have a little bit of overhead. They require more computing power in order to actually uh, process an acid transaction. So acid is kind of a guarantee that a transaction is properly conducted, or if it can't be properly conducted, then it is com completely reverted and not done at all. So checking to make sure that a transaction is completely taken care of, that's a little bit of extra processing power. Uh, holding that transaction in memory and then saving it is a little bit of extra time. Or reverting a change is a little bit of extra time as well. And in really large applications that can add up over a long period of time, over a large number of transactions, etc., etc. So cutting out acid transactions when they're not needed can be really helpful because you're not uh, using as much time on every transaction. Especially it's helpful for things like collecting a ton of uh, data that you know isn't the most important but you're just trying to build like a customer profile for millions of customers or something like that. On the big data side of things acid transactions become l much less important. There's also a thought of server farms. So typically a relational database is stored on a single on a single server computer. It is being held on that computer. The database management system is being run on that same computer so that it can access the relational database from secondary storage. It can access things from secondary storage, move them to main memory, write changes, uh, give information, whatever, and then put that uh, change information back onto secondary storage. Typically that is all happening on one server computer. But when you have really, really, really large databases, they may not be able to fit on one single server computer. Also, if you have a server farm, if you have thousands of computers all in one building, why not take advantage of all that processing power rather than just using them as glorified hard drives? Why not use all of them for their processing power? Why not distribute database work over thousands of computers if you have access to that. So relational databases themselves aren't suited for distributed computing because one computer has to have access to the entirety of the database. Um, but the big players in server farms, really, the big players in big data, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, each started creating their own alternatives their own alternative database management systems that were not relational, that didn't follow the relational model. So Amazon created Dynamo, 
Google created Bigtable and Facebook created Cassandra and then later made Cassandra open source so that everyone would be able to use it. So server farms are a huge, huge consideration when it comes to running a database. If you have that kind of power, you want to use a database that can actually support that kind of system rather than confining it to one computer. So a few type of non-traditional database management systems have emerged since the relational database. The first type is the NoSQL DBMS or the non-relational database management system. Um, these are the database management systems that I just talked about, including Cassandra. Um, so these are non-relational databases. They just have the data and they just have the metadata. They don't have any relationships between tables or anything like that. These are going to keep everything in just tables that don't have relationships between each other. Um, there's no ACID support. So it's very possible that transactions get interrupted part of the way through. Maybe you're trying to store some data in a database and only half of that data gets stored because of some technical whoopsie. And, you know, that happens. Uh, that's just a consequence of working with a database management system that doesn't have ACID support. It allows you to go really fast. Each thing that you do to the database is going to be really fast, specifically because it doesn't have ACID support. It doesn't have that overhead of having to check all the transactions, uh, make sure everything is good before saving or reverting uh, changes when things aren't good. So you're able to put a lot of data into the database very fast. That is a huge benefit, especially if you are working with big data like Amazon and Google and Facebook. That's something that was really beneficial for them. They don't care about a little bit of data loss. They just care about storing as much data as fast as possible. It also requires relatively simple data. So this is going to be things like text, numbers, dates, uh, all that kind of stuff. You're not going to really see a lot of like videos and images and stuff inside of a NoSQL database management system. And then there's the new SQL database management system. Uh, it's very much like a NoSQL database management system. It's not a relational database, but it does have ACID support. So if you really want to make sure that your database, you know, all of those transactions are actually being done correctly, then you would choose new SQL over NoSQL. There's also the in-memory database management system. All the databases are processed mostly or entirely in main memory. So this is opposed to what was happening in relational databases where um, a lot of these tables were fragmented into multiple tables with relationships between each other, specifically because you can't store the entire database in memory at the same time. You have to break it up into smaller chunks that you can work with bit by bit. So the in-memory uh, database management system is actually able to store the entire database entirely in main memory, or at least mostly in main memory due to the advances in how much memory we can actually put in a computer, how much RAM a computer can actually physically have. And it actually supports or extends the relational model. So you can have these... Um, you can have relational databases in an in-memory database management system. So you take this older style of database, which you know does actually still have its benefits. Um, one benefit of the relational system is that you can have different tables, tables that look very different from each other, but still are connected to each other rather than having to translate all of your data to fit into one table. It can be a lot easier to set up a relational database because you can just have databases that feel very natural to the scope of whatever you're working on. For example, the office visits and email tables from the example uh, database that we've kind of been looking at throughout this entire uh, 
chapter. Those might take quite a bit of work in order to translate them to fit all of that information into the student database, right? So like, how would you fit that into a row that has a, you know, a certain number of columns and also starts with a student name? Like, okay, well, what if the student goes to five office hours versus 10 office hours versus uh, two office hours or something like that? How do you store a variable number of office visits into a database like that? How do you store a variable number of emails into a database like that? What if they send a million emails? You enter them all into a table with a million plus different columns, right? Like the benefit of the relational model is that you can, instead of doing all of that, just set up things like the office table, the email table, and the student table and connect them all together in that relational model. And then the in-memory database management system can take those benefits and then also have the benefit of working with all of the databases in memory at the same time. So it's really, really fast to do all of that work instead of having to swap between the different databases, you know, move, take one from storage into memory, do that work, commit those changes back to storage and then pick up the next database, put that in memory, make changes, put that back onto secondary storage and then pick up the first one again, start making changes again, right? That can be pretty inefficient. So when you have an in-memory database management system, you can actually just, you know, work with all of those tables at the same time, which is really useful. So the fact that it's able to support or extend the relational model is extremely helpful. All right. Well, a lot of this technology is very complicated and you might not be working with it directly. That would probably be some IT person's job to directly work with it. I mean, we're even in a computer concepts course, a very like introductory computer concepts course. So why worry about all of these different types of non-traditional databases, right? Well, it's really good to keep track of the developments in this technology because data is so important to modern business and it's probably going to be even more important to future business. So you want to keep track of the different technologies that are out there. You want to be able to make suggestions to uh, information system personnel. If you're trying to design an information system, if you are working with a whole bunch of people and you have a information systems person who is trying to actually create the entire system and it's your job to determine, you know, what the system needs and how it's going to work in your area of the business. It's really good to know about this kind of technology so you can make that kind of suggestions to the people who are actually trying to make it happen. Like, hey, given these requirements, I think a new SQL um, database is going to be really helpful for this because of this, this, and this. So it's really important to keep track of everything, keep track of the changes in database technology that are happening for that reason. It could be good investment opportunities. That's something that the, um, it, that's something that the textbook actually brings up is that if a new technology looks really, really promising, it could be really helpful to get in at the ground floor as a, you know, if you are, in charge of that kind of thing in a business or if you're doing it in your personal life uh, with your personal finances, it could be really good to invest in these promising technologies because if they end up working out really, really well, they're going to explode uh, with how important data is to business nowadays and with how relevant things like big data are. Uh, if they see a really good looking technology out there they they are going to invest in it they're going to buy it they're going to try to make things happen with that technology and putting a financial investment in there could be really good for you so very important to keep track of there 
And then of course, if you are interested in information systems or computer science, you might want to learn how to use each of these different types of databases because it might be helpful if you want to actually, you know, work on this type of stuff yourself. If you actually want to tinker with these databases and set up these um, systems and make everything run. So learning how to use these as a information systems or computer science student would be really helpful because then you know upon graduation upon trying to get jobs saying that you have all this database knowledge would be really really helpful for landing a cushy job so i would include that as a benefit as well all right well that is all of our videos on databases thank you very much for watching